Ready now? Record the session, and um, I'll have these slides available also, too, so you can contact me directly to get the slides or, um, again, the recording if you'd like. And my name is John. If that's for the Microsoft SC or ask for John at Tech Data Microsoft, you'll get me. So some of the other things we do, uh, we do create some tools to help you guys uh, find part numbers, things like that, the slicer matrix, the quick reference guides. Again, uh, easy ways to get those things is to email Microsoft at techdata.com and put matrix in the subject, and it will auto-reply with all those tools that we uh, provide for you guys to put together, and uh, that will help you out. Uh, also, the um, Solution Center, again, I don't know if you've had a chance to visit our Clearwater facility, but we do have a, a really large Solution Center. We have like, a lot of the Microsoft solutions in it that um, I can provide demos or show you things if you want to see them. So again, anything you see today that you might have more interest in, uh, again, ask for me at Tech Data. My name's John Megling, um, the one and only <laughs> here, only Megling here. So if you can get that, or if you just remember John at Microsoft, you will get me. And the MEC, uh, just to follow up on the MEC real quick, we are the only MEC certified distributor. Again, if you don't know what the MEC is, it's a way to experience the Microsoft products in a uh, in a, um, a proctored environment, not necessarily like a, a PowerPoint kind of pitched environment. So it's something, again, you want to you wanna see. Uh, again, I would be the contact person for that, and uh, we can look at doing that for yourself or your, your customers. Uh, we have a way to do it, you know, online now too. So... Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get into the presentation. Again, we're going to be talking about file and storage services. And um, I think Roan is going to start talking to us first. All right. Thanks, John. Um, I hope everybody's hearing me clearly. If you can do that, just quickly say hello in the IM window. Or, or, um, great, great. All right. So let me quickly share my second um, monitor so that you can catch up with our presentation. I just want to let me know if you can, when you're able to see the presentation, let me. So um, as John says, today we're going to be talking about file and storage services in Windows uh, 2012, right? Um, and before we talk, start talking about that, uh, we have a number of persons here supporting John on this this um, this webcast. They include myself. Um, I'm a Microsoft field engineer. My um, speciality or my area of focus is um, Active Directory and, and Group Policies and um, Hyper-V and System Center Virtual Machine Manager. And then you know I have along with me um, you know two. Microsoft great as I call them, Blaine Barton, who is our senior IT pro evangelist um, for this region, and the one and only Adnan Cartwright, who is an MVP for Windows Server. Um, pretty much, um, these guys are, have you know extensive knowledge of the product, and you know they they, they spend a lot of time talking to customers uh, like yourselves about um, Windows Server. So we'll be doing some demos, and we'll doing some presentations, and we will you know it in a in a moment right so here there's some information about admin and we also want you to spend time getting into the product right um, the best way to experience any technology is to download it yourself uh, play around with it you know get a new feel of it right and you'll see how things gel together right there's many 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 avenues of of of, of, of learning for uh, Microsoft um, Windows 2012 server for example you can go for example on the um, Microsoft Virtual Academy website if you want to you know test out some of the things that you'll probably hear in this five-part presentation series and also you can do our, our TechNet virtual labs which give you an opportunity to you know get a feel of the product also without if you don't have the necessary hardware um, to you know to build out a lab for yourself right um, so as I said, you know, we are on uh, part four of this five-part series, and we're talking about file and storage services, right? Now, and that's me. <laughs> um, before I go into the slide, I mean, I, there, 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 there are many things um, 
there's some significant changes in in file and storage in in Windows Server 2012, right? And to understand um, where these changes sit and why the direction, uh, why 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 this particular direction is to understand that one of the core design features for Windows Server 2012 is the ability to have a operating system that is truly a, you know a cloud ready or a data center ready. Um, Server operating system. So, for example, another things what a number of things that you'll see um, is that in in Windows 2012 we have increased the the amount of, for example, Hyper-V workload that a 2012 server can can support. Underlying that is not only from an infrastructure point of view, but also the ability to create a storage infrastructure that allows us to both scale out and scale up our, our file services, right? So one of the things that you will, you'll, you'll hear us talk about is, is the, the flexibility in, in the storage for, for Windows 2012 and the, the options that are available. So for example, um, you know, if you're in the, in the um, environment where you have you know, a SAN, and you, you, you're you used to working with a SAN, you know, previously. One of the things that you'll find is that, I, and, and this is my term, you know, I, I call it um, storage spaces provides this kind of, quote, unquote, um, poor man ability to, to, to provide block storage that allows users that do not have an external SAN to make um, a Windows Server an iSCSI target and have that block of storage presented to you know, a server or a client machine or some application in your environment. So think about, let's say, for example, um, Exchange, right? Uh, pretty much if you're setting up a, an Exchange environment, typically you would want to carve up your LANs on a, on a SAN, you know, and present those LANs to, to, to your Exchange environment. We can do this natively out of the box with, with, with storage spaces in, in, in Windows Server. And then also you have the ability to make that machine, that storage space server, your, uh, an iSCSI target, right? So there, therefore, in that in in that exa in that instance, you can present that block storage to to um, to servers in the environment. One of the other things that you'll notice is that um, while you know storage is, is is in some cases is getting cheaper, right? Um, there's a, 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 a bigger demand for, for larger, you know, blocks of storage also, right? So one of the number of the new features that you'll find in the operating system is that, for example, from a, a VHDX point of view, right, so virtual hard drive point of view, we have a new format, you know, for Hyper-V storage, right? So um, up, to, up to the VHDX format supports up to 64 terabytes of storage um, for, for, excuse me, um, for storing our VHD files, right? Another, another good feature that is available in Windows um, 2012 is data deduplication, right? And um, what deduplication does is it leverages the, the, the concept of, of, of single instance storage and brings that into the ambit of, of, of um, the file system, right? So with data, data duplication in, 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 in um, Windows 2012, right, you can improve your, the efficiency of your, your storage capacity usage, right? Um, so we have capacity optimization. There are kind of three new features for, for um, data duplication, right? And this lets you store more data in, f in less physical space, right? So while with, with um, you, you can do single instance storage, and you can have the, you could have done NTFS compression in the past, right? What data deduplication does? It uses what we call variable size chunking and compression, right? And that what it does, it optimizes your 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 storage infrastructure up to a 20 to 1 um, virtualization ratio, virtualization ratio uh, for VHD VHD library. So let's think about. Um, your, your Hyper-V environment, right? Let's say you have a, 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 a host running a number of um, VHD files, right? Um, and these, let's say they are running Windows 2012 server, right? But they're, one of the things that each VHD file would, let's say, consume about 8 gigs of space per VHD file, right, once created. What data do duplication allows you to do is to address commonalities within the data, right? 
and at the, the sub-file level, right, we do data chunking and compression, right, to optimize the, 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 the data that is common between um, these VHD files, right? So what happens is that files are no longer stored as independent streams of data, but they are replaced with stubs that point to data blocks, right? That have that stores the common information uh, between the, the, the chunks or between the store, right? Another feature um, as far as flexibility is concerned is the whole idea of thin provisioning and, and trim. Um, this is this is not this is not a Microsoft um, feature, so to speak, right? I mean, you it, it it's, it's something that has been you know in the industry for some time. But what it allows us to do is is uh, provision you know as much needed storage as needed at the time of deployment. So let's say, for example, with thin provisioning, let's say you um, you have a user right who needs to. They, they request um, a 500 gig disk, right? Um, but your underlying infrastructure. So let's say uh, let's 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 bump that out a bit, right? So you have three users requesting a hundred gig of data, right? Hundred gig hard drive space, right? Um, so that's 300 gigs, right? But let's say you're you're at a current time, your file system is is only 300 gigs in itself, right? What you can do is you can you again using storage pool and storage spaces, you can create um, these blocks of storage, right? So you can provision um, these um, dynamic disks that uh, that uh, can grow um, essentially to 100 gigs in time. But not necessarily at the outstart. They are not necessarily using up directly 100 gigs of space on your on your on, on your backend storage system, right? So that's what um, thin provisioning is. So the, the 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 user, as they start to consume storage space, right? They will, you know, that 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 amount of data will be added to the file system. How trim comes in is that once once we, let's say for example. We had some storage, and the user reclaims that storage or deletes that storage. We can reclaim that storage that 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 storage that has been deleted into the storage space, so that that can be made available to um, you know another application or another user that needs that 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 storage requirement, right? Some of the other things that 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 have been changed, um, for example, offline data transfer is 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 a new feature. And what ODX does is basically um, eliminate the efficiency of when you're trying to copy data um, across, you know, let's say for example, two um, storage array environments. So let's say for example, we have two servers that are connected into uh, the, the a fiber channel, right? And they're 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 communicating or they're talking to uh, an external storage array, right? Usually, what happens with, with, with the copy process is that um, I the, my disk, so machine A or, or, or server A, it initiates a, a copy process using, uh, let's say, for example, you're doing uh, Windows Explorer, and you're copying the files across. Right? What happen? What would happen is we would move the data off the virtual disk, right, of the TCP/IP stack. Um, across, then the copy process will be initiated between the the two servers, right, at the operating system level, right. Um, what ODX does is that what we're doing instead of um, using the operating system to complete the copy, right, what we're doing is initiating a, a, a copy process uh, um, at the well, we're initiating the copy process on the operating system. But we are actually using the storage array to actually complete the move of the data. So um, one of the things that ODX does it enables um, the ability to have um, live migration, uh, live storage migration to complete more efficiently um, when we do that because we are we are not adding the, the 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 inefficiencies of copying the data up to the server first and copying it up into the TCP/IP stack, but the actual data is moved at the storage array level. And what is passed between the machines is a token, right? A small token that speaks to the actual copying of the data, right? REFS, right, is is um, excuse me, um, is a, a new file system uh, mechanism or, or, or file system structure that 
that is available for Windows 2012, and it brings together some in in increased uh, um, features that are on availability and online operation, right? So, for example, one of the things that RFS allows you to do is to do to to do um, data integrity checks while it's online, right? You know, with NTFS, we can do uh, any kind of changes that we needed to do. For example, you'd have to run check disk and then take it all take the disk offline for repair, right? Um, the, the, and, and Adnan will go into that in, in the demo to show you, um, you know, more specifically how REFS works. But you know, the, some of the things that REFS allows us to do is 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 what we call an allocate and write feature, right? Um, what this happens is that we maximize the real reliability of the environment, right? Um, by allowing it to so the actual write of the data is not done. Um, let's say we're updating a file on an REFS volume. It's not. It's not. It's not. Changes are not immediately written to the file instantly. But we do. Um, as I said, we, we we write in place in a in a location, and then when we close the file, that 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 update is actually updated into the file, right? So that manages the ability where we. We have more reliable file systems, and you know, if, for example, if you have power or disk failures, right, that we would would help us to be able to recover from those um, in a little bit more seamless seamless manner, right? Um, some of the, the other high performance feature, um, SMB Direct, um, for example, what SMB Direct does. And so let's say, for example, you, you, if you have an RDMA enabled card, right? Um, it allows the network card to directly access memory in the upper in the in on the box that they're running. So if you have, for example, large copy operations, right? Um, you you the, the the physical NIC on the box, right? The a lot of the copy would actually take place, you know, via the the memory in in, in the network card, right? And keeping your your CPU available to uh, you know to focus on any operating system or server tasks that you have in your environment. Right, um, SMB multi-channel. What that does, it allows your file share operations to occur much faster, right? Um, because basically, what you're doing, you're opening up multiple um, copy um, SMB channels to between. So let's say, for example, you have two 2012 servers, right? You have two 2012 servers. You have the ability to any open multiple channels of, of copy or data transfer between those servers. And let's say, for example, if one channel fails, right, then it doesn't, you know, cause the the disruption in the actual copy process, right? Here we're talking about, um, for example, some of the storage choices that you that you have, right? So one of the things that we we have done in 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 2012 is, for example, previously. If you wanted to store data, like say for example your your, your hyper -V, your hyper V um, VHDs um, on a on a on a on a on a on a file system, pretty much you would have to have an explicit drive on the local machine, or you'd have to have a SAN and you know have that uh, that that explicit um, location mapped to a, a, a file on 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 the local machine. But here with in in with your storage. If you you have application data storage, you could definitely do a number of things that that in 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 um in 2012, right? Concerning, for example, if you were using um, clustered file services, right, or clustered shared volumes, right, you could use um, SMB. You could store your store your um your your SMB, your your cluster on an SMB file share. And on that file share, you have the ability to store your VHD, your, your VHD files, or your SQL databases. You know, so that's uh, one of the improvements, right? So, so well, as we as we said, um, NIC teaming um, and SMB allows us. You know, the SMB, the new enhancements in the SMB protocol, allows for usage or more processor cord and network connections um, to to improve the performance of data transfer. And also the ability to to manage larger blocks of storage in in uh, 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 on on a file system, right? The other thing is we, we, we want to talk about is is containers ability of the file system, right? So one of the, the the big important things for 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 a number of administrators or or server administrators is 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 server is 
the availability of the file system. Of the file system, right? Um, so a number of things need to happen, right? So let's say, for example, let's start with, with failover clusters, right? Very, very importantly, failover clusters is, is one of the, 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 the features that have changed significantly change significantly in 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 um in in windows 2012 right so if you if you were aware of clustering in in let's say 2003 one of the things that um in 2003 was that if a if a cluster was to fail right one of the shortcomings would be that well, even before we, the, the failure, one of the things that used to ha needed to happen with a cluster is that the cluster nodes, right? Um, each each individual node would could could not have consistent or contiguous access to the the, 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 the file system, right? In 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 2012, right? We have the, the the concept of cluster shared volumes, which we allows us. It's it's kind of an active active file server clusters in the sense where each node in 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 the cluster have simultaneous access to the file system at the same time, right? The 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 so that's the, so from a failover point of view, this this would be a very very important feature that allows us to 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 provide availability and high availability um, for 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 a clustered environment, right? Another thing that we we, we, we we talk about is is DHCP failover, right? Um, with DHCP failover, one of the excuse me, <coughs> with DHCP failover, right? Um, well, DHCP failover, the concept of DHCP failover is supported in 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 windows 2012 right so one of the things one of the limitations previously um what you'd have to do is administrators would do what we call a 80 20 rule so let's say you have a dhcp scope right they would have um, one server online right that manage 80 percent of the scope if that server fails then they would bring the, the 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 server with or with 20% of the scope online to continue issuing DHCP um, issuing automatic IP addresses to to the environment right or they could have two machines up and running right but they would have the the, the scope of the, the, the so a DHCP server would hold multiple scopes and what would happen is that if one server fails then they would bring online that 80% that 20% uh, scope so they would they would have it disabled once the 80 percent machine with the 80 percent scope goes offline then they would enable that second machine what um 2012 allows you to do right it allows two dhcp servers to synchronize their lease information quickly and thus provide optimal availability of a dhcp service right so if one of the servers um if one of the servers becomes available the other server would assume responsibility for servicing clients from the sale same subnet. So, and there's there there are kind of two um, modes that DHCP failover operates in, right? Hot standby, right? Or the, you could have the the, the machines. Um, so, with, in hot standby, what would happen is that if one machine goes down, then the other one would 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 um, would basically continue to be issuing IP addresses, right? And then you could have load sharing mode. Or load balancing mode, where you know you determine that one machine they are using, they, they, they are they are both online and available, but you know the one owns fifty percent and the other owns fifty percent, or one owns sixty percent, um, or or owns forty percent of the scope. Sorry, right? So together, I mean, you know, these things point to a, a new level of availability, right? So we talk a little bit about cluster we're updating, right? That supports the automatic updating of clustered servers, right? So one of the things we, we previously was was patching, was patching or, or or patching our cluster nodes, right? So it would have to be a manual process, right? So what what you'd have to do is is you know run um when, let's say for example you're using um, Windows Update Services, you'd have to Initiate a, 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 a patch management process for that for that um, server. You then um, take it offline, right? Bring a cluster node online, and then 
you know, con continue the patching process until all your nodes are patched, right? With cluster, we're updating, right? What we do, we support support the automatic updating of clustered servers, right? Um, what what the cluster updating does, it, it transparently takes one node of the cluster offline, it then installs the updates and performs a restart of the cluster if needed. So the manual process is removed from the user, right? And then it brings the node back online and then, you know, continues with the, the next node, right? The, another feature that we have is, is how do we make data available across data centers, right? So one of the things that we could do, right, is, is Hyper-V replicas, right? So Hyper-V replica is, is out of the box, the, the kind of, the well, I don't necessarily want to call it a, um, a fault tolerance feature for, for Hyper-V, right? So basically what it does, it, 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 it creates a asynchronous replication of VMs to a, a, a remote site, right? So let's say, for example, if you have a site outage, right, then you'll be able to bring those virtual machines back online, right, and you could use those VMs to 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 uh, restore service. Um, obviously, um, depending on how, depending on what data is stored in the VMs, right, there is obviously a bad uh, uh, a window that you know determines when last the replication of that 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 VM was completed at that remote site. So you have those considerations to take place. That also is configurable. Um, I think out of the box, if I'm correct, is is it's 15 minutes, right? Um, but it's 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 one of the introductory features of availability um, from a, a Hyper-V point of view. Um, there are other options, obviously, where, that we, we um, are available when we talk about um, live migration, um, live storage migration, um, also as, as, you know, the I would call it a la carte of availability for um, for your virtual machine environment, right? Right. Um, <clears throat> a little bit, you know, touching back on um, the new file system, right? Um, for example, with NTFS, NTFS is still available um, as as the out of the box um, file system for Windows 2012, right? But there are, you know, some checklist has some there has been some improvements in checklist where there's, uh, I'd call it, mm, you know, available, excuse me, the, avail the availability to quickly um, self-heal, right, um, when there are some data corruption issues on, on the volume, right? So let's move our, our next slide, right? Um, so here we're talking about um, drilling down a little bit on continuous availability, right? So from a failover clustering um, for, for point of view, right? Um, so this is something that has been around for in, in the Windows environment for a number of years, right? But say, for example, if your file server, if your file server cluster fail or, or um, you know, any, it might be SQL or Hyper-V, right, that was dependent on it, it would fail before another node in the cluster would start, right? And uh, providing you know services to to have availability to the environment, right? So what happens in 2012? File server clusters can run at active active, right? With basic load balancing, as I said, and I kind of you know drill down on a number of these things already, right? So in this case, I, uh, let me click on this machine. Um, so one of the node goes offline. So you know the the um the the Windows 2012 allows failover to other nodes in the environment, allowing um, availability of the environment, right? So we talk about um, efficiency in, 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 in management, right? And really, and, 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 and truly, I, I think what the, the, the efficiency comes in, in the, what we call the, the, the one-to-many approach, right? Where um, you can, first of all, you can manage um, the file system on multiple servers or across your data center from one interface. And um, when when Adnan does his demo, you'll 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 see a bit of that, right? So first of all, one of the things that is 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 very very important, right? So as I said, we talk about server management, right? So previously, one of the things it, it was kind of difficult to to manage all your servers on the, on the on your network um, efficiently without a, a central 
or integrated tool, right? So we had Server Manager in 2008 and above, but it was not really a, a true multi-server management tool because really you'd still have, you know, a number of MMCs open, right? Um, let's say you'd have to manually open an MMC and connect to the machine, right? But with, with the, the one of the things in 2012 is that the enhanced server manager in Windows 2012 helps you to manage multiple servers and you can perform such tasks as deploy roles and features remotely to both physical or, or if you have VHD files, right? So we can do a number of things. We can manage file servers. We can provision servers remotely. We can do offline. We can manage virtual hard disks that are offline also. So it's basically like injecting um, applications into the disk, right? Right? And it's truly a, a real central management interface for your server. So one of the things, um, this provisioning, you know, we could not do that um, remotely previously. You can provision disk, you can format disk um, remotely on um, from uh, the file service and manager or, or server manager inside Windows <coughs> Server um, 2012. Right. The other thing is is PowerShell, right? Um, from a from a PowerShell 3.0, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And even more extended in um in PowerShell um 4.0 in R2 is that there are a number of, of features that you can do you can bring to to bear on the file system from a PowerShell point of view. So um, you know when we think about some of the things that you can do, I mean, even from the Hyper-V point of view, you can manage um, your your the creation, the setup, the restart of your 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 virtual machines out of PowerShell 3.0 right at the command prompt. But also from a storage point of view, you can create storage spaces from using PowerShell. You can you know create your VHDX files and you know and 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 have them carved out and this space carved out from the PowerShell point of view. And the for for users who are not readily familiar with um with PowerShell, um the PowerShell um integrated scripting engine is, is a very, very powerful tool because it allows you to quickly search for commands, right? And gives you this kind of integrated help. It's kind of a, a walk along um scenario where you know if you don't know a command right or if you know you know the first line of a command you can quickly type it into your PowerShell window and you'll have it will gives you you know the next steps or the next um, switches that you can actually add to that, that that PowerShell command right so here right so for example one of the the, the in, in this in this in this scenario right we have an admin right and it, again, PowerShell has this one-to-many approach. So here, if he he can do a number of steps, right, in a workflow, right. So he can trigger the reboot of a machine, right, and in 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 a, in a seamless way. So the PowerShell workflow is also. Sorry, I, I clicked on the. Let me go back one. Right. Would that be too fast, right? So here, here we have, as I said, an a, 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 an administrator, administrator, sorry, starting a one-to-many script remotely, right? Um, and most of the servers at the bottom just run to complete and report results back, right? Server one has a has a reboot, right? You know, perhaps it's it's some plan maintenance, right? And or some required condition that needs to be met for the script, right? Server two experiences a hardware failure and is offline so sometimes, right? So, however, right, what happens with in, in the workflow scenario, right, is that the once the once the the, 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 the the script doesn't time out, right? But what will happen is that once the condition is re, um, remediated, <coughs> corrected, then the script will 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 um will it's not only it's interruptible but it's also recoverable in this scenario, right? So that's one of the new new features for for PowerShell 3.0 in 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 in, in uh, Windows 2012, right? So the idea here, I mean, and and you know, just quickly touching over these uh, was that um, Windows Server 2012 provides a number of flexible storage options, right? 
and you know flexible from the point of view that you can you know you you have multiple ways new file system and new file system structure new file uh, new, new new virtual file formats and also you can have the operating system operate as stand storage itself similarly or similar to stand, stand storage itself in the, in the form of an iSCSI target or you can leverage storage pool and storage spaces to carve out um, disk and prevent log um, prevent present uh, more um, logical disk space that is physically available at the time, you know, so that you can grow your infrastructure as, as a need arises, right? So obviously, these set of improvements help you to respond, you know, to the changing environment needs and, you know, also maintain high availability and to do so in a, in, in a cost-effective way, right? Right? So flexible storage, right? We talk about that continuous availability, right, and and also uh, management efficiency, right. Uh, when we talk about that one-to-many approach in managing multiple servers from from a from a single a single console, sorry. Right? Um, so here we're talking again about trying downloading that that the the, the server edition, play around with it, get a feel of the new features, and you know get yourself comfortable. With with um, working with the new features that that are available, um, in Windows file system features that are available, file and storage system features that are available in in Windows 2012. Um, before we close out, I'm just gonna switch over to to Adnan for Adnan to do to demo some of the features that are available, and um, we have a, about 50 minutes, so Adnan, you can you can take it away. Okay. There you go. And then? Forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> 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 Good afternoon. Um, I hope everybody is enjoying the presentation thus far. What I would like to take uh, a look at for you guys and demo is the file system um, resource manager. Server 2012 has brought many new innovations to the market, um, to the platform for IT, for us to be more productive, for us to be more efficient, for us to take control of our environment. So what I have here in my Hyper-V environment um, I have a domain controller that's running server core. I also have a Windows 8 client, and my member server that's getting the snot beat out of it, I have um, Active Directory Rights Management Services, Exchange 2013, my file services, and then the, F F the um, FSRM services running on it. So with that being said, let's head over to our member server. Um, and to install FSRM, we already have it installed, but I still want to walk you through that process. You can start the installation because everything in Server 2012 is easy. Um, we will hit the next button, select the server of your choice. And once you reach here on the file and storage services, you would select file and SCSI, expand that. And once you get here, you are going to select the file server resource manager. Now, typically what this tool does, it, it allows you to take control over what files go onto your file server. So let's demo that. We're gonna head over to the tools menu and file server resource manager. Here, this is the pretty much typical screen we've come to use to, but now we have this file screening management as well as classification management that's being added. If we take a look at our file groups here, we can see all the files here are basic by default that's available to us to block. Um, we've added a torrent file because what we've seen, what I've seen in previous environments that I've visited is that you would have employees put no-no files that are on the server, um, put no-no files on the, on the company's file server, and that's pretty, 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 pretty bad. Um, <laughs> those video files can be huge in content. Um, and as well as size. So to prevent all of this from happening, the first thing we do is create a file group. And in that file group, we're gonna give it a name, which is the torrent file, 
block, which we already established here. The files to include would be everything .torrent. So that's already there. Pretty much straightforward with this with this step. The next step will be the screen templates we would like to apply. You will create a file screen template. And what I love about it is this. Once we put a template name in, uh, we already do have that template name in, which is block torrent files. But what I do want to show you is this. You can do an active screening, which you just don't want to, you don't want the files to be placed on your server to begin with. Um, once coupled with an email solution, um, the administrator will the administrator will receive an email notification of who and what file did he try to put on the server. The passive screening would be like, okay, I know I have a user on my on my in my organizations that's putting these files on, but I don't know who. So what we're going to do, we're going to allow users to save these files, but we're going to start using this monitoring tool that when they put the files that we block it'll send the administrator a notification. Here in the email portion of it, it gets angry when you don't put a name. So we'll put a name right there and then uh, and we have to do have to select a group. So here we can send an email to the administrator, which we pretty much have already set up. So if we take a look at our block turn files and we go to edit template, Everything here is set up for us. We're going to do octa screening. We don't want it at all. And if we scroll down, we see that the torrent file block is already applicable. If we come to the email messages, I am going to receive an email as well as the user is going to receive an email. So the next step from here is the file screens. Which folder on which file server do you want this to be applicable to? Well, here we have the Florida, the Florida IT Server Group data file that's applicable here. And once this is set in motion, we can jump right over here to our client machine and let's open up our documents. And here's that torrent file that we spoke about, right? So we right click this and hit copy and we head back over to the computer where we have a mock drive right over to our FISG data file. We right click and we select paste, we get an access denied. The beautiful part about this is that when, if I even if I try again, it'll still block. So we'll skip this out, and we will receive a notification via email to let us know that okay, you tried to do something that you weren't supposed to do, and now we are aware of it. So that's one great new innovative way that Microsoft has placed and added to the file services that has given us the ability to take control of what goes on to our file server, what goes on to a folder. It can even be applicable down to user files. It doesn't even have to be the file server. If we head back over, and there's the email notification right there. You're no, no, now you're in trouble. So the next thing that I do want to point out, um, let me head back over to the member server right quick, is that this doesn't have to be applicable only to files and folders that are on the server itself. If we create another file screen and we want to ask where the screen path is going to be, if we browse it, we can browse out the actual shares to user data and those can be blocked too as well. So something to take into consideration when you're looking at your file server and resource monitor portion of it. The next thing I do want to take a look at quickly um, is the REFS partition table, which is cool technology that Microsoft has developed to help battle the fight against bit rot. Um, if you don't know what bit rot is, bit rot takes place when a hard drive that that is being too consistently, but not in the same sector, has gone bad, and you aren't made aware of that sector going bad because it's not being checked. It goes right back to what Rowan was saying about that checksum, and, and that check this the new advanced features in REFS. REFS. What I love about it is this: when a bad sector is detected in REFS that sector is closed off. Whatever data is in that sector is moved out of that data, or out of that sector, I'm sorry, and placed into a sector on the hard drive that is that is actually good, that is that is real good, and that sector is closed off, so no data can be longer, no data can, can be written to that portion of that bad sector of the disk. Go right back to make it easy. If we come here to this unallocated volume that we have, we right click it, new simple volume, next, is something that we're all familiar with, hit next again, next, but instead of NTFS, we're going to select REFS. And now we have that in place and we can hit next and finished. 
So we're going to format it now. We have a REFS volume all set, ready to go. And we're going to format that this. And we're going to do a quick format. Hit OK. Close it out. And we come back to computer. And now we have a REFS volume all set, ready to go. It works well inside of your stored spaces within Server 2012. So Microsoft is really taking the initiative to put IT. It's like, I can't stress this point enough. We're at the helm. We're in control. We can do what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it. I hope that the little um, this demo that we have put together can be proven to be useful for you now in the future. With that um, I'll give it back to Blaine and the guys, um, and that's pretty much all that I have with you for you guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Roan. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Adnan, for, for jumping in and covering today's part four of five uh, today uh, with uh, tech data. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to John. John, thanks for having us. Oh, yeah, no problem at all. Um, just to, again, want to say thanks to everyone for, uh, you know, attending today's session, part four. Um, and then we'll be having another, the last session in this series, Next week, next Wednesday, I know a lot of people have signed up, and I'll be sending out reminders to uh, for that. And, again, thanks to the guys, Blaine, Rowe, and Adnan, for taking care of everything. We really appreciate it. We do have a question, it looks like, from uh, – I don't know if Roan's going to type the answer to the question. You may want to just talk about it, about the – okay, so I guess the file blocking stuff in the REFS is only on the server. You can't push it down to the workstation piece yet. So we got that answered there. So – Wanted to throw that out there. Anyways, uh, thanks to anyone. To, we can open it up now for questions. Uh, if you want to, if you want to, again, you don't want to talk. You want to type the question. Feel free to to um, to type us a question. And again, if it's something you don't want to bring up in this format, you can always contact me. Again, my name is John Megling, and I'm pretty easy to get a hold of at Tech Data. Just get into Tech Data, ask for John, the Microsoft SE, or um, my extension is 82031, option two off of uh, you know pretty much the menu there in tech data so i'm going to go ahead and stop